In cracking the code for the CX index that's published by Forrester every year, uh, what I pointed out is that uh, the three quality factors are actually, uh, uh, you know, influencing the three loyalty factors. And what's behind this first one for effectiveness is how how set customer centered your engineering is, how customer centered is your business model, and your operations. How proactive is our every is every person or every group across your company? That's really what shapes effectiveness. It's not some CX program or CX group that can create that because, in fact, if you have weak or uh, non-customer-centered engineering business models and operations, no, no amount of customer experience program can make up for that. And so we've got to get back to the basics and really engage these people in understanding customer expectations and being customer-centered in the work that they do from all the decisions they make, all the handoffs that they give, and uh, continually improving accordingly. The key for ease is how, how well your policies, processes, handoffs, and attitudes in your headquarters groups are customer-centered. These things, the ease is generally not dictated by your customer-facing people and touch points, although you know, those have a lot to do with it, but we have generally ignored all these people at headquarters who are the ones who hamstring the customer touch points or empower those touch points. And then, as I mentioned, those three quality factors are the means toward the goals of customer loyalty. And so if we are seeing quite a lot of um, positive progress on the right-hand side compared to the left-hand side, we're seeing a lot of investment into customer success, CRM, loyalty, we're seeing all that expand and we get excited and we think, wow, our company is customer centric. Look how much hiring we're doing here. Um, it may be a mirage uh, because well, by and large, a lot of these customer experience programs are trying to make up for failures in the effectiveness and ease. Uh, the failure is associated with the um, equation at the upper left corner here because customer experience is nothing more really than what customers got, their realities, what they perceived, that's their realities, and that in comparison to what they were expecting. Who shapes what they're expecting? Marketing and sales. Uh, in fact, everyone in your company may be shaping what they're expecting by uh, you know various levels of quality that they're that they're uh, producing and therefore that history, it's a cumulative thing, right? The history shapes the expectations. So if we are in fact trying to cut corners now, um, shrinkflation, skimpflation, that's what I call Jenga management. And um, so, so much that we, we kind of celebrate maybe a mirage. And the, the solution for it in cracking the code is to conduct expectations VOC and use that to educate everybody about their performance standards. So for sales and marketing on retention, for example, what should be their acquisition standards so that you're attracting and bringing in customers who you have a higher likelihood of retaining, who are less costly to serve, this would greatly increase your retention and uh, re reduce your cost of operations, which then would minimize your need to, to engage in things like skimflation and, and shrinkflation and layoffs of your CX team and so forth. So we need to be thinking about expectations VOC, which is largely qualitative. What are the customer comments? You probably have a lot of this on hand. You don't have to necessarily get a, a budget expansion to go doing that research. Just look at your customer comments and then help everyone understand hey, as we're re-engineering these processes, as we're uh, getting ready for our 2023 strategy, here's the customer experience um, standards that are applicable to your role or to this process or this business model. And it's not necessary to ask customers, you know, what should we be doing in our, in our business models and whatnot. 
just translate what customers are saying they're trying to get done. And that is the expectations we're talking about. What are your customers trying to get done? What is their aim? And when you can focus your organization on achieving your customer's aim, all of those details about the transaction uh, criteria and so forth will, uh, you know, they'll, they'll kind of solve themselves, they'll pop out. So these performance standards are, are really important. And what you can see in the center of this is a team sport. We're making customer experience a team sport by engaging all these groups in doing their part. Their job depends upon customers paying for it. When customer buying uh, cuts down, then jobs have to cut down, right? And in fact, all of these things that we talk about in our meetings, who cares? If customers aren't buying, it all goes away. So we need to be elevating these customer standards to a much higher level of visibility in meetings, in performance reviews of organizations and people and so forth in, in, uh, in KPIs. Take the survey stuff out, just put these performance standards from the expectations VOC into the KPIs. That will get you very far in your strategy. And uh, finally, make sure that your strategy is emphasizing preventing issues. When you prevent problems, then that reduces the load on the touch points. It reduces the, the need to continually expand your customer service and other remedial efforts um, as your sales expand. Think about it, month by month, year by year, your sales are supposed to be growing. And if you are not addressing the root causes and preventing issues, then all of your remedial expenses for customer service, uh, cost to serve customers, the escalations, negative word of mouth, the churn, the efforts to churn around churn and all that stuff, that's got to grow linearly with your revenue growth or sometimes exponentially because, let's face it, sometimes there's a group of customers who've been patiently tolerating certain things and then suddenly they're not and it puts a huge drain a strain on uh, escalations and uh, other uh, other aspects of cost to serve or perhaps a uh, sudden customer churn so in talking about customer experience strategy i found it best to be thinking about customers expectations versus the realities and what does it take to drive a one-to-one -one ratio so this is what I call the customer experience management ROI model. And it was uh, something that I sketched out after doing those correlation analyses in my five-year study of global customer experience practices. So what I found was there was a tremendous amount of effort being done on customer voice and also retention and loyalty and business results. And essentially we could park almost everything that's being done in customer experience management in those two buckets. And it really bothered me because I thought, well, why are we collecting this voice? Why are we bothering customers to take up their precious time and effort to collect this when we're not really doing anything with it? We're just patting ourselves on the back, uh, giving managers a safe pass because they're, they're in the, the safe zone of performance. So business as usual, that's not what it's about. Uh, when I was voice of the customer manager, uh, I, I came in in the total quality management days where the whole idea was to manage your business smarter than your competitors. At that time, we were facing a lot of competition from Japan in particular in producing better products, better services. You know, everything uh, was more efficient and, and economical with the Japanese products. And so we were really trying to figure out how to get into our customers' heads in order to, you know, adjust our products and quality and services and business models accordingly to outpace our competitors. Now with the net promoter score, I think all of that's kind of gone out the window uh, to a large degree, uh, measuring transactions like crazy. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about what the heck, why are we doing this? What is it really doing for the customer experience in the course of the customer experience management. Sometimes the whole the whole management of customer experience is, is uh, maybe not even helping the customer feel 
a better experience. So what I wanted to show is that customer voice is data that needs to be translated into intelligence, meaning you're looking for the patterns across a, a set of data or multiple sets and sources of data. What are the patterns? What are some aha that really perks the, the attention of your managers? Customer intelligence is where we would need to be putting a lot more of our energy and not just relying on these automated uh, software. We need to be thinking a lot about what's important to our operations people, our engineering people, our manufacturing people, legal, safety, finance. How do we translate the customer voice into meaningful actions or meaningful insights that guide them as expectations VOC for their performance standards and continually raising the bar in the way that we produce the realities for customers. Because let's face it, the bar is continually increasing for their expectations unless we're continually raising the bar in the realities that we're, we're delivering, we're going to always be behind the curve. So you can see what I'm calling here on the right-hand corner is experienced leadership, company-wide alignment to customer, employee, and partner expectations because we rely on these groups, customers, employees, and partners to fuel our business. When their performance sags and everything sags, we really need their performance to be top notch. And so we need to be thinking about how do we close the gap between their aim and our aim. So we're both aiming at the same thing. And this is what I mean by managing to those expectations and closing the gap. So the next step is customer focused strategy and customer centricity. You need to take this customer intelligence, customer lifetime value. Now the value actually prioritizes um, what to work on first, as well as um, right sizing your effort and apply it to your corporate strategy, apply it to the way that people think and do. So anything that you have in your company that's shaping the way that people think, your training, your onboarding, your uh, inner, your incentives, your rewards, your, your reviews of all kinds, your per permissions and approvals of all kinds, those shape people's thinking and doing. So be injecting, embedding the customer intelligence and lifetime value insights into all of those and that's how you shape the culture and the strategy. Next is customer experience improvement and innovation, which includes human-centered design. So improvement means getting to the root cause of those issues that are prevail prevalent in the customer experience that are tied strongly to loyalty. So we do a correlation analysis, a Pareto analysis to identify the, the, the vital few. And we let go of these quick wins as the obsession. Uh, we need to let go of those quick wins as an obsession because they're derailing us from making the big gains associated with vital few in the, uh, the Pareto uh, tied to these key driver analysis. So if this is all Greek to you, send me a note. I'm always glad to, uh, to answer any details. And uh, I see you're here, Maher, glad to, glad to see you here. Any questions you have, uh, please post them. Um, but customer experience improvement, I, I'm really dismayed that the CCXP blueprint has erased the word improvement. That's a travesty. We need to reinsert it and we absolutely need to emphasize it for 2023 strategy. And then what this leads to is engaging your internal people commensurate with what you're expecting to engage externally or more because your internal people bread and butter you know their their livelihood their their salaries their budgets the dividends for investors are all dependent upon customers preferring your brand and therefore we need to be really bold and engaging people but we need to be clever about it and make sure that the the way that we're sharing the customer experience insights and driving the improvement and innovation actually fits into people's jobs, that it fits into the existing meetings, reviews, recognition, rewards, improvement efforts, decision-making, handoffs, insert your customer experience stuff into what they're doing 
And this is how you get that strong engagement. Now we had over a hundred action plans going on simultane simultaneously during several years of boom growth. I mean, we had hockey stick growth happening and it was hard to keep people's attention on improving customer experience. And yet we made major strides. So in conclusion, I wanted to emphasize that to get there, there are six competencies for experienced leadership. First of all, establishing a customer lifetime value mindset across your company. Second, driving customer-centered action to address the prevalent issues. How well are we really getting to the root cause of the, the most pressing things, the, the things that are coming up month after month, year after year? Let's just get to the root of those and get them off the slate so people aren't calling in or churning because of those issues anymore because those issues don't exist. That's the point. This is how we create massive ROI in customer experience. It's how we create massive gains. It's how we did it. Uh, I mentioned having 100 plans at the same time. In that period, we were saving millions of hours and millions of dollars for our customers uh, because this is the, the, what I've been describing to you is exactly the way that we were managing customer experience. So it's possible. Use customer experience insights in all of your growth plans, the enterprise use of insights, re-engineering, creating new products and services, your, any strategies. Customer experience insights should be at the beginning as well as continued through like human-centered design, for heaven's sakes, not as an afterthought or, you know, a nice to have. Customers are really, at, should be at the core of everything. So this means we need to have aligned motivations. We need to respect interdependencies and we need to have consistency to intentions. Because if these things are screwed up internally, it's going to show up externally. So thank you so much for joining me today and uh, hope, hope you have a good weekend. Take care.